Section 12 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 12. No, England was not for her. Her place was in Kokensee, and her business now was to do what her governesses used to call improve her mind. Perhaps, if she improved it enough, Robert would talk to her again sometimes, and this time not on the little treasure basis, but on the solid one of intellectual companionship. Might she not end by being a real helpmate to him? Somebody who would gradually learn to be quiet and analytical and artful with grains. She went indoors and wrote then and there to London, renewing the long-ended subscriptions to the Times, Spectator, Clarion, Hibbert's Journal, and the rest. She asked for a catalogue of the newest publications that were not novels. Her determination was too serious just then for novels. Ordered Herbert Spencer's first principles, for she felt she would like to have some principles especially first ones, and said she would be glad of any little hint the news agent could give her as to what he thought a married lady ought to know, and she spent the rest of the evening and the two following days laying the foundations of intellectual companionship by looking up the article Manua in the Encyclopedia Britannica and paraphrasing it into conversational observations that sounded to her so clever when she tried them on Herr Dremmel three days later at tea-time that she was astonished herself. She was still more astonished when Herr Dremmel, having listened, remarked that her facts were wrong. "'But they can't possibly,' she began, then broke off, feeling the awkwardness of a position in which one was unable to argue without at once revealing the encyclopedia. Chapter 27 This was in May. By the end of the following May, Ingeborg had read so much that she felt quite uncomfortable. It had been a fine, confused reading, in which Ruskin jostled Mr. Roger Fry and Shelley lingered, as it were, in the lap of Mr. Macefield, the news agent, who must have lived chiefly a great many years before, steadily sent her mid, early, and pre-Victorian literature. And she, ordering on her own account books advertised in the weekly papers, found herself, as a result, one day in the placid arms of the Lake Poets, and the next being disciplined by Mr. Marinetti one day ambling unconcernedly with Lamb, and the next caught in the exquisite intricacies of Mr. Henry James. She read books of travel, she learned poetry by heart, she grew skilful at combining her studies with her cooking, and propping up Keats on the dresser, could run to him for a fresh line in the very middle of the pudding, almost without the pudding minding and since she loved to hear the beautiful words she learned aloud, and the kitchen was full of a pleasant buzzing, a murmurous sound of sonnets as well as flies, to which the servant got used in time. But though she set about this new life with solemnity, for was she not a lopped and lonely woman whose husband had left off loving her, and whose children had been taken away, cheerfulness kept on creeping in, the chief obstacle to any sort of continued gloom was that there was a morning in every day. Also she had enthusiasms, those most uplifting and outlifting from oneself of spiritual attitudes, and developed a pretty talent for tingling. She would tingle on the least provocation, with joy over a poem, with admiration over the description of a picture and thrilled and quivered with response to tales of beauty, of the beauty of the cathedrals in France, miracles of coloured glass held together delicately by stone, blown together, 
she could only think from the descriptions in their exquisite fragility by the breath of god rather than built up slowly by men's hands of the beauty of places the lagoons round venice at sunrise the desert toward evening of the beauty of love faithful splendid equal love of all the beauty men made with their hands little spuddy things running over dead stuff blocks of stone bits of glass and canvas fashioning and fashioning till at last there was the vision pulled out of a brain and caught forever into the glory of line and colour she longed to talk about the wonderful and stirring and vivid things life outside kokensee seemed to flash with what must it be like to talk to people who knew and had seen what could it be like to see for oneself to travel to go to france and its cathedrals to go to italy in the springtime when the jewels of the world could be looked at in a setting of clear skies and generous flowers or in autumn when kokensee was grey and tortured with rainstorms to go away there into serenity to where the sun burned the chestnuts golden all day long and the air smelt of ripened grapes and she had only seen the rigi well that was something and it seemed somehow appropriate for a pastor's wife she turned again to her books what she had was very good and she had found an old woman in the village who did not mind being comforted so that added to everything else was now the joy of gratitude it seemed indeed that she was to have a run of joys that spring for besides these came suddenly yet another the joy so long dreamed of of having someone to talk to and such a someone thought ingeborg entirely dazzled by her good fortune for it was ingram she was paddling the punt as usual down the lake one afternoon a pile of books at her feet when passing the end of the arm of the reeds that stretched out round her hidden bay she perceived that her little beach was not empty and pausing astonished with her paddle arrested in the air to look she recognized in the middle of a confusion of objects strewn round him that no doubt had to do with painting sitting with his elbows on his drawn-up knees and his chin in his hand ingram he was doing nothing just staring she came from behind the arm of reeds half drifting along noiselessly out towards the middle of the lake straight across his line of sight for an instant he stared motionless while she holding her paddle out of the water stared equally motionless at him then he seized his sketching book and began furiously to draw she was out in the sun and had no hat on her hair was the strangest color against the background of water and sky more like a larch in autumn than anything he could think of she seemed the vividest thing suddenly cleaving the pallors and uncertainties of reeds and water and flecked northern sky don't move he shouted in what he supposed was german sketching violently so it's you she called back in english and her voice sang yes it's me all right he said his pencil flying he did not recognize her he had seen too many people in seven years to keep the foggy figure of that distant november evening in his mind i'm coming in she called digging her paddle into the water sit still he shouted but i want to talk sit still she sat still watching him unable to believe her good fortune if he were only here again for a single day and she could only talk to him for a single hour what a refreshment what a delight to talk in english to talk to someone who had painted judith to talk to someone so wonderful to talk at all 
she was as little shy as a person stranded on a desert island would be of anybody kings included who should appear after years on the solitary beach well she called after sitting patiently for what she felt must be half an hour but which was five minutes he did not answer absorbed in what he was doing she waited for what seemed another half an hour and then turned the punt in the direction of the shore i'm coming in she called and as he did not answer she paddled towards the bay he stared at her his head a little on one side as she came close what are you going to do he asked seeing she was manoeuvring the punt into the corner under the oak tree land said ingeborg he got up and caught hold of the chain fastened to the punt's nose and dragged it up to the beach how do you do she said jumping out and holding out her hand mr ingram she added looking up at him her face quite solemn with pleasure well now but who on earth are you he asked shaking her hand and staring her clothes now that she was standing up were the oddest things recalling back numbers of punch you're not staying at the glambecks and except for the glambecks there isn't anywhere to stay but i told you i was the pastor's wife you did last time well and i still am but when was last time don't you remember you were staying with the glambecks then too but i haven't stayed with the glambecks for an eternity at least ten years seven said ingeborg seven and a half it was in november but you must have been in pinafores and you walked down the avenue with me don't you remember no said ingram staring at her and you scolded me because i couldn't walk as fast as you did don't you remember no said ingram and you said i'd run to seed if i wasn't careful don't you remember no said ingram and i had on my grey coat and skirt don't you remember no 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 said ingram smiting his forehead and i don't believe a word of it you're just making it up look here he said clearing away his things to make room for her sit down and let us talk are you real yes and i live in kokensee just round the corner behind the reeds but i told you that before said ingeborg you do live he said pushing his things aside you're not just a flame-headed little dream that will presently disappear again my name's dremmel frau dremmel but i told you that before too the things a man forgets he exclaimed spreading a silk handkerchief over the coarse grass there sit on that you're laughing at me she said sitting down and i don't mind a bit i'm much too glad to see you if i laugh it's with pleasure he said staring at the effect of her against the pale green of the reeds where had he seen just that before that scandinavian colouring that burning sort of brightness in the hair it's so amusing of you to be frau anything she smiled at him with the frankness of a pleased boy you're very nice you know he said smiling back you didn't think so last time you called me your dear lady and asked me if i never read well and didn't you he said sitting down too but a little way off so that he could get her effect better yes do sit down then i shan't be so dreadfully afraid you're going why but i've only just found you but last time you disappeared almost at once into the fog and you'd only just found me then she said her hands clasped round her knees her face the face of the entirely happy after all i seem to have made some progress in seven years he said i apparently couldn't see then no it was me i was very invisible invisible oh moth-eaten dilapidated dun-coloured and i'd been crying you look here nobody with your kind of colouring should ever cry it's a sin it would be most distressing seriously if 
you were ever less white than you are at this moment see how nice it is not to be a painter said ingeborg i don't mind a bit if you're white or not so long as it's you but why should you like it to be me asked ingram to whom flattery used as he was to it was very pleasant and feeling the comfort of the cat who is being gently tickled behind the ear because said ingeborg earnestly you're somebody wonderful oh but you'll make me purr he said and i see your name in the papers at least once a week she said oh the glory and berlin's got two of your pictures bought for the nation yes it has and haggled till it got them a dead bargain and you've painted my sister what he said quickly staring at her again why of course that's it that's who you remind me of the amazing judith are you such friends she asked surprised oh well then the wife of the master of ananias let us give her her honours she's the most entirely beautiful woman i've seen but but what oh well i did a very good portrait of her the old boy didn't like it what old boy the master he tried to stop my showing it and so did the other old boy what other old boy the bishop but if it was so good it was it was exact it was the living woman it was a portrait of sheer exquisite flesh well then said ingeborg oh but you know bishops he shrugged his shoulders italy's got it now it's at venice the state bought it you must go and see it next time you're there i will she laughed the very next time and her laugh was the laugh of joyful amusement itself ingram was now forty-three or four and leaner than ever his high shoulders were narrow his thin neck came a long way out of his collar at the back and was partly hidden in front by his short red beard his hair darker than his beard was plastered down neatly he had very light piercing eyes and a nose that ingeborg liked she liked everything she liked his tweed clothes and his big thin hands the wonderful hands that did the wonderful pictures and his long thin nimble legs she liked the way he fidgeted and the quickness of his movements and she glowed with pride to think she was sitting with a man who was mentioned in the papers at least once a week and whose pictures were bought by states and she glowed with happiness because he did not this time seem anxious to go back to the glambecks at once but most of all she glowed with the heavenliness the absolute heavenliness of being talked to and you're her sister he said staring at her now that really is astonishing but everybody can't be beautiful a sister of hers here tucked away in this desert it is a desert you know i've come to it because i wanted a desert one does sometimes after too much of the opposite but i go away again and you live in it what have you been doing all these years since i was here last oh i've been busy but not here not all the time here yes all of it what not away at all i went to zopat once zopat where's zopat i never heard of zopat i don't believe zopat's any good do you mean to say you've not been to a town to a place where people say things and hear things and rub themselves alive against each other since last i was here well but pastors wives don't rub but it's incredible it's like death why didn't you because i couldn't as though it weren't possible to tear oneself free at least every now and then you wait till you're a pastor's wife but how do you manage to be so alive for you shine you know 
when I think of all the things I've done since I was here last. He broke off and looked away from her across the lake. Oh, well, sickening things, really, most of them, he finished. Wonderful pictures, said Ingeborg, leaning forward and flushing with her enthusiasm. That's what you've done. Yes, one paints and paints, but in between it's those in between the work fits that hash one up. What do you do in between? In between what? Whatever it is you do in the morning and whatever it is you do in the evening. I enjoy myself. Yes, yes, that's what I'd like to do. But don't you? I can't. What? You can't? she said. But you live in beauty. You make it. You pour it over the world. She stopped abruptly, hit by a sudden thought. I beg your pardon, she said. I don't know anything, really. Perhaps you're in mourning? He looked at her. No, he said. I'm not in mourning. Or perhaps... No, you're not ill. And you can't be poor. Well, then, why in the world don't you enjoy yourself? Aren't you ever bored? he answered. The days aren't long enough. He looked round at the empty landscape and shuddered. Here, in Kokensee, he said, it's spring now, but what about the wet days, the howling days? What about unmanageable months like February? Why, he turned to her, you must be a perfect little seething vessel of independent happiness, bubbling over with just your own contentments. I never was called a seething vessel before, said Ingeborg, hugging her knees, her eyes dancing. What an impression for a respectable woman to produce. What a gift to possess, you mean, the greatest of all to carry one's happiness about with one. But that's exactly what you do. Aren't you spilling joy at every step? splashing it into all the galleries of the world, leaving beauty behind you wherever you've been. He twisted himself round to lie at full length and look up at her. What delightful things you say, he said. I wish I could think you mean them. Mean them? she exclaimed, flushing again. Do you suppose I'd waste the precious minutes saying things I don't mean? I haven't talked to anyone really for years, not to anyone who answered back. And now it's you. Why, it's too wonderful, as though I'd waste a second of it. You're the queerest, most surprising thing to find here on the edge of the world, he said, gazing up at her. And there's the sun just got at your hair through the trees. Are you always full of molten enthusiasms for people? Only for you. But what am I to say to these repeated paintings? he cried. You got into my imagination that day I met you, and you've been in it ever since. I was in the stupidest state of dull giving in. You pulled me out. He stared at her, his chin on his hand. Imagine me pulling anybody out of anything, he said. Generally I pull them in. It's true, I've had relapses, she said. Five relapses. Five? She nodded. Five since then, but here I am, seething, as you call it, and it's you who started me, and I believe I shall go on now, doing it uninterruptedly forever. Ingram put out his hand with a quick movement, as though he were going to touch the edge of her dress. Teach me how to seethe, he said. That's rather like asking a worm to give lessons in twinkling to a star. Wonderful, he said softly, after a little pause, to lie here, having sweet things said to one. Why didn't I find you before? I've been being bored at the Glambacks for a whole frightful week. Oh, have you been there a week already? she asked anxiously. Then you'll go away soon? I was going tomorrow. That's like last time. You were just going when I met you. But now I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay and paint you. She jumped. Oh! she exclaimed, 
awestruck. Oh! Paint you and paint you and paint you, said Ingram, and see if I can catch some of your happiness for myself. Get at your secret. Find out where it all comes from. But it comes from you. At this moment it's all you. It doesn't. It's inside you, and I want to get as much of it as I can. I'm dusty and hot and sick of everything. I'll come and stay near you and paint you, and you shall make me clean and cool again. The stuff you talk, she said, leaning forward, her face full of laughter. As though I could do anything for you. You're really making fun of me the whole time, but I don't care, I don't care about anything, so long as you won't go away. You needn't be afraid I'm going away. I'm going to have a bath of remoteness and peace. I'll chuck the Glambex and get a room in your village. I'll come every day and paint you. You're like a little golden leaf, a beech leaf in autumn, blown suddenly from God knows where, across my path. Now it's you making me, Purr, she said. You're like everything that's clear and bright and cool and fresh, oh, murmured Ingeborg, radiant, and I haven't even got a tail to wag. Already, after only ten minutes of you, I feel as if I were eating cold, fresh, very crisp lettuce. That's not nearly so nice. I don't think I like being lettuce. I don't care. You are. And I'm going to paint you. I'm going to paint your soul. Tell me some addresses for lodgings, he said, snatching up a sheet of paper and a pencil. There aren't any. Then I must stay at your vicarage. You'll have to sleep with Robert, then. What? Who is Robert? My husband. Oh, yes. But how absurd that sounds. What does? You're having a husband. I don't see how you can help having a husband if you're a wife. No, it's inevitable, but it's quaint. That you should be anybody's wife, let alone a pastor's, here in Kokensee. She got up impulsively. Come and see him, she said. You wouldn't last time. Come now, let me make tea for you. Let me have the pride of making tea for you. But not this minute, he begged, as she stood over him, holding out her hand to pull him up. Yes, yes, he's in now. He'll be out in his fields later. He'll be frightfully pleased. We'll tell him about the picture. Oh, but you did mean it, didn't you? She added, suddenly anxious. He got up reluctantly and grumbling. I don't want to see Robert. Why should I see Robert? I don't believe I'm going to like Robert, he muttered, looking down at her from what seemed an immense height. Of course, I mean it about the picture, he added in a different voice, quick and interested. It'll be a companion portrait to your sisters he laughed that would really be very amusing he said stooping down and neatly putting his scattered things together ingeborg flushed but that's rather cruel fun isn't it that you're making of me now she murmured what he asked straightening himself to look at her the light had gone out of her face what why didn't I tell you my picture of you is to be the portrait of a spirit? He pounced on his things and gathered them up in his arms. Come along, he said impatiently, and be intelligent. Let me beg you to be intelligent. Come along. I suppose I'm to go in the punt. What's in it? Books by the dozen. What's this? Euchin? Keats? Pragmatism? Oh, Lord! Why, oh, Lord? she asked, getting in and picking up the paddle while he gave the punt a vigorous shove-off and jumped on to it as it went. She was radiant again. She was tingling with pride and joy. He really meant it about the picture. He hadn't made fun of her. On the contrary. Why, oh, Lord, she asked. You said that, or something like it, last time, because I didn't read. Well, now I say it because you do, he said, crouching at the opposite end, watching her movements as she paddled. 
but that doesn't seem to have much consistency does it she said hang consistency i don't want you addled and you'll get addled if you topple all these different stuffs into your little head together but i'd rather be addled than empty nonsense if i could i'd stop your doing anything that may alter you a hairbreadth from what you are at this moment to that she remarked suspending her paddle in mid-air her face as sparkling as the shining drops that flashed from it that she really was greatly enjoying herself and they both laughed ingram waited in the parlour where he stood taking in with attentive eyes the details of that neglected almost snubbed little room while ingeborg went to the laboratory so happy and proud that she forgot she was breaking rules to fetch as she said robert robert however would not be fetched he looked up at her with a great reproach on her entrance for as invariably happened on the rare occasions when the tremendousness of what she had to say seemed to her to justify interrupting he thought he had just arrived within reach after an infinite patient stalking of the coy elusive heart of the problem mr ingram is here she said breathlessly he gazed at her over his spectacles in the parlour said ingeborg he's come to tea isn't it wonderful he's going to paint who is here ingeborg mr ingram edward ingram come and talk to him while i get tea she had even forgotten to shut the door in her excitement and a puff of wind from the open window picked up herr dremmel's papers and blew them into confusion he endeavoured to catch them and requested her in a tone of controlled irritation to shut the door oh how dreadful of me she said hastily doing it but with gaiety i do not know then said herr dremmel mastering his annoyance mr ingram but robert it's the mr ingram edward ingram the greatest artist there is now the great portrait painter berlin has is he a connection of your family's ingeborg no but he painted you then it's not necessary for me to interrupt my afternoon on his behalf and herr dremmel bent his head over his papers again but robert he's great he's very great herr dremmel with a wetted thumb diligently rearranged his pages but why i told him you'd love to see him what am i to say to him if you don't come herr dremmel his eye caught by a sentence he had written was reading with a deep enormous appetite tea said ingeborg desperately there's tea you always do come to tea it'll be ready in a minute he looked up at her gathering her into his consciousness again tea he said but even as he said it his thoughts fell off to his problem and without removing his eyes from hers he began carefully to consider a new aspect of it that in that instant had occurred to him there was nothing for it but to go away so she went chapter twenty eight ingram's visit to the glambecks had in any case been coming to an end the next day when he was to have gone to konigsberg on his way to the caucasus a place he hoped might trick him by its novelty for at least a time out of boredom and the baron and baroness were greatly surprised when he told them he was not going to the caucasus but to kokensee instead with one voice they exclaimed kokensee to paint the pastor's wife's hair said ingram the baron and baroness were silent the explanation seemed to them beyond comment its disreputableness robbed them of speech herr ingram of course an artist of renown if he had not been of very great renown they could not have seen their way to admitting him on terms of equality into their circle might paint whose ever hair he pleased but 
was there not some ecclesiastical law forbidding that the hair of one's pastor's wife should be painted to have one's hair painted when one was a pastor's wife was hardly more respectable than having it dyed people of family were painted in order to hand down their portrait to succeeding generations but you had to have generations you had to have scions you had to have a noble stock for the scions to spring from and the painting was entered into soberly discreetly advisedly in the fear of god for the delectation of children not lightly or wantonly not for effect not as herr ingram had added of frau pastor's hair because any portion of one's person was strangely beautiful strangely beautiful they looked at each other and the baroness raised her large and undulating white hands from her black lap for a moment and let them drop on to it again and the baron slowly nodded his entire agreement ingram had found a room in the village inn at kökensee a place so sordid so entirely impossible as the next habitation after theirs for one who had been their guest that the baron and baroness were concerned for what their servants might think when they heard him direct their coachman in the presence of their butler and footman as he clambered nimbly into the dog-cart to take him to it and the baroness went in and wrote at once to her son hildebrand in berlin who had introduced ingram to glambeck and told him she did not intend permitting herr ingram to visit her again to please you she wrote i did it but how true it is that these artists can never rise beyond being artists i have finished with outsiders however clever give me gentlemen she did not mention she found she could not mention the hair and to the baron that evening she expressed the hope that at least the picture would only be in water-colour water-colour she felt seemed somehow nearer the commandments than oils it was impossible to paint a serious picture of ingeborg in the dark little parlour at the parsonage and as there was no other room at all that they could use ingram began a series of sketches of her out of doors in the garden in the punt anywhere and everywhere i must get some idea of you he said perceiving that a reason for his coming every day had to be provided later on i'll do the real picture in a proper studio i wonder how i'll get to a proper studio smiled ingeborg i've got a very good one in venice you must sit to me there as though it were round the corner but these are very wonderful she said taking up the sketches i wish i were really like that it's exactly you as you were at the moment nonsense she said but she glowed she knew it was not true but she loved to believe he somehow by some miracle saw her so the sketches were exquisite little impressions of happy moments caught into immortality by a master hardly ever did he do more than her head and throat and sometimes the delicate descent to her shoulder the day she saw his idea of the back of her neck she flushed with pleasure it was such a beautiful thing that's not me she murmured isn't it i don't believe anybody has ever explained to you what you're like there wasn't any need to i can see for myself apparently that's just what you can't do it was high time i came oh but wasn't it she agreed earnestly he thought her frankness her unadorned way of saying what she felt as refreshing and as surprising as being splashed with clear cold shining mountain water he had never met anything feminine that was quite so near absolute simplicity he might call her the most extravagantly flattering things and she appreciated them 
and savoured them with a kind of objective delight that interested him at first extraordinarily then it began to annoy him you're as unselfconscious he told her one afternoon a little crossly when he had been ransacking heaven and earth and most of the poets for images to compare her with and she had sat immensely pleased and interested and urging him at intervals to go on as a choir boy but what a nice clean soaped sort of thing to be like she said and so much more alive than lettuces i wonder if you are alive he said staring at her and she looked at him with her head on one side and told him that if she were not a bishop's daughter and a pastor's wife and a child of many prayers and trained from infancy to keep carefully within the limits of the allowable in female speech she would reply to that you bet but that's only if i were vulgar that i'd say that she explained gentility is the sole barrier i expect really between me and excess you and excess you little funny cold watery early morningly thing one would as soon connect the dawn and the fields before sunrise and small birds and the greenest of green young leaves with excess he was more near being quite happy during this first week than he could remember to have been since that period of pinafore in which the world is all mother and daisies he was enjoying the interest of complete contrast the freshness that lies about beginnings from this remoteness this queer intimate german setting he looked at his usual life as at something entirely foolish hurried noisy and tiresome all those women good heavens all those women who collected and coagulated about his path what terrible things they seemed from here women he had painted who rose up and reproached him because his idea of them and their idea were different women he had fallen in love with or tried to persuade himself he had fallen in love with or tried to hope he would presently be able to persuade himself he had fallen in love with women who had fallen in love with him and fluffed and flapped about him monsters of soft enveloping suffocation women he had wronged absurd word women who had claims on him claims on him on him who belonged only to art and the universe and there was his wife good heavens yes his wife from these distresses and irksomenesses from a shouting world from the crowds and popularity that pushed between him and the one thing that mattered his work from the horrors of home life the horrors of society and vain repetitions of genialities from all the people who talked about thought and art and the mind of the world from jealousies affections praises passions excitement boredom he felt very safe at kokensee to be over there in the middle of the distracting emptiness of london was like having the sour dust of a neglected market-place blown into one's face to be over here in kokensee was to feel like a single goldfish in a bowl of clear water ingeborg was the clear water kokensee was the bowl for a week he swam with delight in this new element for a week he felt so good and innocent exercising himself in its cool translucency that almost did he seem a goldfish in a bib then ingeborg began to annoy him and she annoyed him for the precise reason that had till then charmed him her curious resemblance to a boy this frank affection this unconcealed delight in his society this ever ready excessive admiration were arresting at first and amusing and delicious after the sham freshness the tricks the sham daring things of the women he had known they were like a bath at 
the end of a hot night like a country platform at the end of a stuffy railway journey but you cannot sit in a bath all day or stay permanently on a platform you do want to go on you do want things to develop ingram was nettled by ingeborg's apparent inability to develop it was all very well it was charming to be like a boy for a little while but to persist in it was tiresome nothing he could say nothing he could apply to her in the way of warm and varied epithet brought the faintest trace of self-consciousness into her eyes what can be done he thought with a woman who will not be self-conscious she received his speeches with enthusiasm she hailed them with delight and laughter and what was particularly disconcerting she answered back answered back with equal warmth and with equal variety sometimes he suspected annoyed at being outdone in epithet with even more to judge from her talk she almost made love to him he would have supposed it was quite making love if he had not known if he had not been so acutely aware that it was not with a face of radiance and a voice of joy she would say suddenly that god had been very good to her and when he asked in what way would answer earnestly in sending you here and then she would add in that peculiar sweet voice she certainly had thought ingram a peculiar sweet voice a little husky again a little like a choir boy's but a choir boy with a slight sore throat i've missed you dreadfully all these years i've been lonely for you and the honesty of her the honest sincerity of her eyes when she said these things no choir boy older than ten could look at one with quite such a straight simplicity every day punctually at two o'clock by which time the daily convulsion of dinner and its washing up was over at the parsonage he walked across from his inn while kökensee's mouths behind curtains and round doors guttered with excited commentary telling himself as he gazed down the peaceful street that this was the emptiest gossip freest place in the world to the gremmel gate and dodging the various rich puddles of the yard passed round the corner of the house along the lilac path beneath the laboratory windows to where at the end of the lime tree avenue ingeborg sat waiting then he would sketch her or pretend to sketch her according as the mood was on him and they would talk by the second day he knew all about her life since her marriage her six children they amazed and appalled him her pursuit started by him of culture her housekeeping her pride in robert's cleverness her solitude her thirst for someone to talk to persons like ilsa and rosa frau dremmel robertlet and ditty became extraordinarily real to him he made little drawings of them while she talked up the edge of his paper and he also knew by the second day all about her life in redchester its filial ardours its duties its difficulties when it came to disentangling itself from the bishop and his paper sprawled up its other edge with tiny bishops and unattached expressive aprons the one thing she concealed from him of the larger happenings of her life was luzerne but even that he knew after a week so you can do things he said looking at her with a new interest you can do real live things oh yes if i'm properly goaded i wonder what you mean by properly goaded well i was goaded then goaded by being kept in one place uninterruptedly for years that's what is happening to you now oh but this is different and i've been to zopat zopat besides you're here but i won't be here for ever oh but you'll be somewhere in the same world as though that were any good of course it is 
i shall read about you in the papers nonsense he said crossly the papers and i shall curl up in your memory as if i were dead you sometimes really are beyond words ridiculous i expect it's because i've had so little education she said meekly at tea-time almost every day herr dremmel joined them in the garden and the conversation became stately the sketches were produced and he made polite comments he discussed art with ingram and ingram discussed fertilizers with him and as neither of them knew anything about the other's specialty they discussed by force of intelligence ingeborg poured out the tea and listened full of pride in them both she thought how much they must be liking and admiring each other robert's sound sense his quaint and often majestic english his obviously notable scientific attainments must she felt sure deeply impress ingram and of course to see and speak to the great ingram every day could not but give immense gratification to robert now that he had become aware of who he was she sat between the two men in her old-fashioned voluminous white frock looking from one to the other with eager pride while they talked she did not say anything herself out of respect for such a combination of brains but she was all ears she drank the words in it was more mind-widening she felt even than the clarion ingram hated tea-time at the parsonage every day it was more of an effort to meet herr dremmel's ceremoniousness appropriately and his scientific thirst for facts about art bored ingram intolerably he detested the large soft creases of his clothes and the way they buttoned and bulged between the buttonings he disliked him for having sleeves and trousers that were too long he shuddered at the thought of the six children he did not want to hear about superphosphates and resented having regularly every afternoon to pretend he did and he did want and this became a growing wish and a growing awkwardness to make love to herr dremmel's wife herr dremmel's large unconsciousness of such a possibility annoyed him particularly his obliviousness to the attractiveness of ingeborg he would certainly deserve thought ingram anything he got it was scandalous not to take more care of a little thing like that every day at tea-time he was enraged by this want of care in herr dremmel and every day before and after tea he was engrossed if abortive efforts to philander can be called so in not taking care of her himself you see said ingeborg when he commented on the immense personal absences and withdrawals of herr dremmel robert is very great he's wonderful the things he does with just grains and of course if one is going to achieve anything one has to give up every minute to it why even when he loved me he usen't to even when he loved you interrupted ingram what doesn't he now oh yes yes she said quickly flushing i meant of course he does and besides one always loves one's wife no one doesn't yes one does they left it at that at the end of his second week in kokensee ingram found himself increasing the number of his adjectives and images and comparisons growing almost eagerly poetical for the force of proximity and want of any one else to talk to or to think about was beginning to work and was becoming the one thing that seemed to him to matter to get self-consciousness into her frank eyes something besides or instead of that glow of admiring friendliness he was now very much attracted and almost equally exasperated she was after all a woman and it was absurd it was incredible that he ingram with all these opportunities 
should not be able to shake her out of her first position of just wonder at him as an artist and a celebrity she was so warm and friendly and close in one sense and so nowhere at all in another so responsive so quick so ready to pile the sweetest honey of flattery and admiration on him and so blank to the fact that well that there they were he and she and then she had a sense of fun that interrupted a sense most admirable of a woman at any other time but not when she is being made love to also she was very irrelevant he could not fix her she tumbled about mentally and that hindered progress too not that he cared a straw for her mentality except in so far as its quality was a hindrance it was that other part of her her queer little soul that interested him her happiness and zest of life and of course the graces and harmonies of her lines and colouring you know i suppose he said to her one evening as they walked slowly back along the path through the rye field and the cool sense of the ended summer's day rose in their faces as they walked that i'd give a hundred days of life in london or paris for an hour of this atmosphere this cleanness that there is about you i don't think a hundred's much i'd give them all to be with you here now in the rye field isn't it wonderful this evening isn't it beautiful did you smell that she stopped and raised her nose selectingly just that instant that's convolvulus you have such faith in my gods he went on when he could get her away from the convolvulus such a bravery of belief such a dear bravery of belief well but of course she said turning shining eyes on to him who wouldn't believe in your gods art love of beauty but it isn't only art my gods are all sweet things and all fine things said ingram convinced at the moment that he had never done anything but worship gods of that particular flavour so thoroughly was he being purged by the hyssop of life in kokensee oh said ingeborg with an awed enthusiasm how wonderful it is that you should be exactly what you are but it is clever of you she added with a little movement of her hands smiling up at him to be exactly what you are and do you know what exactly you are you're the open window in the prison house of my life she held her breath a moment how very beautiful she then said how very beautiful and how kind you are to think of me like that but why is it a prison house you of all people it isn't living you see its existence in caricature over there it's like dining perpetually with madame tussaud's waxworks or anything else totally unreal and incredible but i don't understand how a great artist and you're like an open window like the sky like sweet air like freedom like secret light oh she murmured deprecating but enchanted when i'm with you i feel an intolerable disgust for all the chatter and flatulence of that other life and when i'm with you she said i feel as if i were stuffed with oh with stars he was silent a moment then determined not to be outdone he said when i'm with you i begin to feel like a star myself as though you weren't always one no it's only you till i found you i was just an angry ball of mud but a thirsty man in a stuffy room but an emptiness a wailing blank an eviscerated thing a what asked ingeborg who had not heard that word before and you he went on are the cool water that quenches me the scent of roses come into the room liquid light to my clay she drew a deep breath it's wonderful wonderful she said 
and it sounds so real somehow really almost as though you meant it oh i don't mind you making fun of me a bit if only you'll go on saying lovely things like that fun of you have you no idea then positively no idea how sweet you are he bent down and looked into her face with little kisses in each of your eyes he said scrutinizing them end of section twelve